Welcome back to the Legal Roundtable here on the Oscar Pistorius Trial, a carte blanche channel. I'm now joined in the studio by tonight's legal experts. We've got two well-known faces, Professor Stephen Tucson, practicing attorney linked to Wits University. I've got former Zimbabwean High Court judge, former South African acting High Court judge, Chris Greenland, and a newcomer. And we're absolutely delighted to have a prominent figure, a well-known figure in uh, the divorce and criminal uh, attorney world. I've got Billy Gundelfinger. Thank you. Week three, Billy, and finally you've arrived. Oh, it's taken me a bit of time. It yes, has, but it's an absolute it's long, pleasure. It's a long way from Norwood. <laughs> it is, and thank you for making that long haul for us. Pleasure. Stephen, I'm going to ask, go to you first, because you, you're the old hand on this one. Um, I think it, we were taken somewhat by surprise that uh, Harry Nell said he's almost wrapping up his case. He's got four to five more witnesses, and he'll finish early next week. We anticipate what, Monday or Tuesday. <laughs> Do you get the sense that we're at that stage of the trial where... He's done enough. He, fe he will feel that he's done enough. Well, it's uh, not surprising. The state has to prepare their case with the worst case scenario in mind. If the defense disputes everything and we have to prove every little detail, we will need these 107 witnesses. But if the defense makes uh, many admissions, it's unnecessary to call those witnesses because the facts have been admitted. And so we typically see half the witnesses aren't needed at all. So that accounts for that. And also, I think uh, Kheri must believe that he's established the issue which has to be proved, and that is mens rea or intent. Yes. Chris, you got something on that? Yes, I think also it's a fundamental reality that in this trial it's not an issue of who done it. No. It's why. So that explains why the trial will tend to be shorter rather than longer. Yes. I think one of the important things that is that um, and what people are asking is you know we take for granted the process and what happens in court yes but what most people don't understand you know um, particularly overseas observers is they don't they don't get it that the state's leading their case at the moment and unlike the adversarial system in America for example where you have the defense and the prosecutions at each other's throat all the time with the intervention continually of the judge. Yes. Our system is different in that, um, you know, what I get from overseas attorneys and solicitors is Kheri Nell seems very um, quiet mm. and uh, not really participating because they don't understand. I mean, Kheri Nell, I've known for many years, he's one of the top advocates, uh, prosecutors in the country. And at the moment, what he's doing is he's leading the state's case. At the end of the state's case, as they've said, he, he's going to wrap up, uh, I think he said, four or five <coughs> witnesses, and then he would close his case. Once he's closed his case, um, the defense can bring what's called a 174 application for a discharge, right. um, which is probably unlikely in this case. You would think, yes. And then the defense would then present their case. Once the defense presents their case, Barry Rue will be leading his witnesses. He'll be the quiet at, one. He'll be the quiet one. And then Kheri Nell will be cross-examining the witnesses. Yes. And um, I, I think that um, also with, with regard to the judge, I mean, the, the judge is, a, is, is an excellent judge. Um, I think but, it's an important all, point because people judge, feel she's too yeah, quiet, yeah, but she, that, that's that, not that's, her role. Yeah, and, and that's also what's uh, been a lot of criticism by the, by the public yeah. and also you know, from overseas. But the public, our public, have never been exposed to a trial such as this. And they, I mean, judges have personalities and there are judges that are very proactive during the proceedings. Um, but this particular judge who has a very interesting background. Mm -hmm. uh, to the best of my recollection, I think she was a journalist. That's right, she was a prime reporter world, on the Sowetan. Uh, the Sowetan and the world um, in earlier years uh, uh, reporting on rapes and murders and she qualified, I think, when she was in her 40s. In her 50s, actually, many Witzes, many Witzes people. Yeah. And um, as I said, you know, she's not going to miss anything. And then we have the, the two assessors who People also don't understand what, what the function of the assessors are. Yeah, we've, now, been, we've, yeah. we've established that, that they will help her on matters, on matters of, fa of, of, law, fact. of fact, but no. not matters of law. Correct. But I think one thing we've never actually found out is who they actually are, have we? We've never actually delved into no. 
what their background is. We know that uh, the the woman uh, um, Du Toy, that's right, is an admitted advocate. Whether she's a practicing advocate, I'm not sure. I believe both of them are she, she, advocates. Um, I think she's <coughs> at a law clinic. And the Timber is yeah, the other one. And and he's, I understand he's uh, an attorney that's been uh, recently qualified attorney. Okay. But the point of the matter is, and what I think what's really interesting is that on matters of fact, the assessors can actually outvote yeah. the judge. The judge rules, and I get asked this very frequently, the judge rules on questions of law. And whereas fact. And, and fact. And fact, yes. But the assessors only deal with questions of law. And obviously when it comes to questions, sentencing... Questions of fact. Yeah, questions of fact. And when it comes to sentencing, it's, it's the judge that will... Exactly. Chris, you had something to say on that? Yes, on the role of the judge, uh, what we need to understand, and this is how it's expressed in our profession, that the judge should be reluctant to get involved, lest her vision be clouded by the dust of the conflict. <laughs> it's a lovely way to express it, isn't it? And she, she certainly hasn't allowed her eyes to be clouded by the dust of war. Let's look at what's been happening today. Um, I think there might have been some surprise at the brief cross-examination by Barry Rue. We have seen him being quite pedantic and uh, uh, taking his time in cross-examining witnesses. When it came to the ballistics, the blood spatter, he was very short Though he did give us an indication, he's got his own witnesses, hasn't he, Stephen? Explain sure. the significance there. Well, the conclusion that I draw from the brief cross-examination is that he's not worried by the testimony at all of the witnesses today. He's basically saying, so what? We know that uh, shots were fired through the door which caused her death, and it really matters not which was the first or second shot. Uh, what this trial is about, the issue, is his intention at the time of shooting and I don't believe he believes that the forensic ballistic evidence demonstrates uh, any uh, murderous intent or otherwise uh, although he did get a bit uh, uh, chippy about the double tap yes. because it directly contradicts Michelle Berger's testimony of one one two three yes so he he, he, he took that issue up and he tried to make it uh, to dispute it. And also whether she'd have a time to scream between the shots. And I start Correct. to see the thread coming now between Michelle Berger's testimony. And we all start to understand why she was in the, being cross-examined for such a long time. Correct. He needed to uh, chip away at her. Because that directly contradicted the version. That, that, Whereas the ballistic evidence, neither here nor there. But do we see the thread now from Michelle Berger through to Professor Simon, through to the ballistics expert? But Sorry, Billy, uh, I'll come to you, Chris. Billy? I think that, um, you know, in looking at all this, you've got to understand that the, the defense is a putative private defense. Yes. And in order for Oscar to walk, as it, as it were, he would have to show that uh, he acted reasonably, and this is a subjective, subjectively, yes. and that he made a genu genuine, honest mistake. Right. And those are the two factors which, at the end of this, this matter, will be argued. I mean, that, that's the criteria. That's why his testimony then, is so vital. Yes, but, but in addition to that, the fact that he um, has been charged with premeditated murder, um, he can, obviously, it's also competent to be found guilty of murder or culpable homicide. homicide right. And what's interesting is that the sentencing in relation to those different categories. I'm going to ask you about that. Hold that thought uh, because we'll come to this issue of the possible sentences. In fact, I know it's one of the questions we ask, get asked regularly through the tweets. Chris, you wanted to pick up on something as well? Yes, just to add to what Professor Tucson said about why it was unnecessary for Advocate Rue SC to cross-examine more extensively. He's quite correct. But from the public's point of view, I can assure you that they're going to say uh, Barry Rue for the first time uh, faced uh, Captain Chris uh, what's Mangena? His? Mangena. Mangena, who stood tall and proud and unwavering oh, it's and certainly didn't waver uh, under fire. That's the way they interpret it. Yes, I think also let's explain the strategy that he uses. He puts scenarios to Captain Mangena mm. to see if, if he will agree that his interpretation of the facts accords with his client's version of events. Yeah. We've seen that happening time and time again. Yeah. Happen to he want, there is another explanation. Yeah. 
do you think it fits my clients? He just wants that concession, doesn't he, Stephen? Yeah, he's asking the expert witnesses, you have postulated an inference, a, a, a theory of what happened. On the same facts, we don't dispute the factual material, another scenario is possible, another interpretation of what could have happened on the same facts. Yes. And if he can extract that concession, then his version is a, is a reasonable possibility and there's doubt. Just, I, you, tell me about the mind of a judge when you've got two experts on objective scientific facts with their own subjective interpretations. How do you decide between the two of them? Uh, with great difficulty. But the fundamental rule is, as I explained before, you're only an expert when you prove it. And the way you prove it is by your reasons. Yes. So jurisprudentially, uh, the judge is concerned or has to be concerned with the reasons mm -hmm that are proffered in support of the opinion because as regards experts we are in what's called the opinion evidence realm yes um, and um, that is the rule it's the reasons that are proffered by the experts that will that will sway the court well, what, the, what uh, the judge is saying is the expert can't pull an opinion out of the air. Right. It must be based on objective proved facts and with legal, rational, logical reasoning. And if that reasoning is sound and the facts are proved, then the opinion is valid. Now we're going to come back to this discussion. I, I do want to uh, get from Billy Gundelfinger the sentencing options here. I know we, it's not like we're jumping the gun and convicting Oscar. It isn't the case. What we are really wanting to address is a question that I, gets asked time and again on Twitter about the scenarios in South African law in general and that's the way we'll address it. We'll also have a look at this rather short testimony and cross-examination by uh, one of the witnesses, Colonel Mike Sales. I'll get the view from the panel on that. Many other issues as well and I'll tell you one thing I'm going to ask of Billy Gundelfinger because he is new to our panel what he thinks of this open court and the cameras and the microphones there as well. Remember you can join us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and WeChat by searching for Oscar Trial 199. At last count we had, and it's amazing how much it's increasing 111,600 Twitter followers in just three weeks. It's extraordinary. 10,400 Instagram followers, 82,800 Facebook fans. A little later in the show, we'll be looking at your tweets sent in to the legal panel to answer your questions, and I'll see you right after the break.